CDC is investigating Lyme. Now, Chicago Tribune is a reputable outlet. Um, so, you know, based on the source, there's nothing dodgy going on here. In fact, based on the headline, the headline itself is not uh, wrong. A healthy doctor did die two weeks after getting the COVID vaccine, and the CDC is investigating Lyme. But what's being used here clearly is a manipulation technique to try to frame this article in a way to get people riled up about the vaccine. And in fact, um, this is not an exception. This was the most frequently shared news story on Facebook during the first quarter of 2021. Um, so in a, lo a lot of our research, we're not so much focused on what's fact-checked as true or false, but we're focused on media manipulation more generally. And that's the definition that I maintain in this talk and in our research that it's about the presence or absence of common misinformation techniques. So we don't necessarily want to promote binary ideas about truth. Um, you know, as we've seen throughout the pandemic, as the science evolves, so can our understanding of, of what's true or not. Um, for example, you know, the, the effects of ibuprofen on, on COVID-19, you know, at first uh, they thought it was damaging and then there was the consensus that it wasn't. So, you know, sometimes as our scientific understanding evolves, so does our definitions of what claims are true or not. So we figure a better way to do this is to actually um, point people to the cues um, that are used to produce misinformation more generally and help people calibrate their sense in terms of how accurate or how manipulative uh, a certain piece of information is. So that's kind of the framework in which we're operating. Um, now, um, the primary tools we have at the moment that are used are fact-checking and debunking to correct misinformation. Uh, very important tools. Um, uh, you know, I fully endorse uh, these tools because they're very important, but they also come with some limitations. Uh, and one of those limitations that the literature has identified through lots of meta-analyses is what we call the continued influence of, of misinformation. So once people are exposed to a falsehood, it continues to linger in our memories even when people acknowledge having seen a correction. Now, the explanation for that is there's two kind of um, uh, neurological explanations for that. One is that people fail to correctly link uh, the, the, the fact check to the myth in their memory, um, so they're not properly linked. Uh, and the other is called a retrieval error, which is that um, people fail to, they connect it, but they fail to correctly retrieve the myth uh, alongside the, or the correction alongside the myth from memory. Um, and this is because the myth has become more prominent in, in memory than the correction. This happens when you keep repeating the myth, it strengthens the connections that the myth has in your memory with lots of other things that you know. And when the correction forms a more minor part of the fact check or the, or the, uh, or the debunk, um, it, well, typically what it does is it strengthens the myth because you keep repeating it um, and people fail to adequately retrieve the correction, right? So either people fail to link it in the first place or the, there's an error in the retrieval process. Um, now, there are ways to try to optimize for this, which is to really make the correction as prominent as possible and try to avoid talking about the myth altogether. But the problem with debunking is that you're forced into a rhetorical frame where you now have to repeat the misinformation in order to debunk it. Um, so to try to get around this um, issue, um, plus the fact that, you know, practically uh, it takes two seconds to produce misinformation and, you know, detailed fact checks sometimes take weeks or, or even or a few days to produce. You can't fact check um, every single piece of misinformation that's, that's out there. Um, so to try to prevent this from happening, we focus on this idea called pre-bunking, which is the opposite of debunking uh, through a process known as psychological inoculation. So what is inoculation? Inoculation follows the medical analogy exactly. Uh, it was first introduced by a social psychologist in the 60s, um, which he labeled a vaccine for brainwash, though he never actually tested it in the context of misinformation. So that was interesting, but, but the analogy stands. So the idea is that just as with the regular vaccine, where you inject people with a weakened dose of the virus or an inactivated strain of the virus uh, to trigger the production of antibodies to help induce resistance against future infection, it turns out you can do the same uh, with the mind by preemptively exposing people to weakened doses of misinformation or the techniques used to spread misinformation, people can build up cognitive antibodies over time. So the idea really is that, you know, when you get a vaccine, it's all about showing your immune system uh, examples of the pathogen uh, uh, that's, that's threatening to the body, right? The more examples your immune system sees, the stronger they can mount an immune response. And it's really the same with the mind. The more examples your mind has 
of what misleading content looks like, um, the better it is uh, in encountering it. Now, the important thing here is not to overwhelm the psychological immune system by duping people uh, with misinformation. You want to show them weakened or inactivated strains of, uh, of, of the virus. And that's why it differs from fact that we're not for the a weak, or a weakened simulation of the misinformation instead uh, and how to potentially refute it. Um, now, the psychological variant uh, includes a, a forewarning, uh, which is important to jumpstart the psychological immune system. People are busy. They're not paying attention. What we know from, from people's attention span is that if you tell them that there's people out there trying to deceive them, it triggers what we call deception monitoring. So people become more likely to monitor information and receptive to whatever you're going to be saying next which is the pre-bunk, which in the literature is called refutational preemption. So you preemptively try to refute a future falsehood. Uh, it's a bit difficult, so we just termed it uh, pre-bunking. Um, now, <clears throat> initially the news came out with these articles, Cambridge scientists consider fake news vaccine, it's possible to vaccinate Americans, uh, specifically according to this, uh, this article. One journalist even called us asking if this was fake news. Um, so, you know, we asked people to read the article and, and see what they think. Um, so I won't have time in this talk today to, to go through all of the research that, that we've done in the past. You know, we started out uh, in the context of climate change. So, you know, we warned people in advance that there's that there's political actors trying to deceive them and that they use specific techniques to try to sow doubt about the scientific consensus on climate change. And then we gave people what we call the microdose of giving them some examples of what this deception looks like. And then we tested them in the lab later on with the full dose. Um, and we found that people became more immune, not full immunity, but people became more uh, resistant. Um, now, there's lots of review articles we have in the literature for people who are interested in, in reading about uh, this idea of inoculation theory and, and the lab studies that we've done. Um, I'm just showing you a few here. Um, but, but at the end of the day, these, these are lab studies, right? And so what I'm interested in sharing with you is, is kind of our latest field work. Um, we took some uh, inspiration from uh, the uh, Harry Potter novels from Professor um, Severus Snape, who basically said that uh, your defenses must be as flexible and inventive as the arts that you seek to undo. Um, and so, you know, people don't come into the lab and read a 600 word pre-bunking essay uh, in order to get their immunity. So we wanted to turn this into a, a real world intervention. So we produced a game called uh, Bad News. Uh, Bad News is a real world social media simulation where people are exposed so we can doses of the larger strategies that are used to produce misinformation. I'll show you those in a second. Uh, this was a gamified intervention that, you know, millions of people uh, were exposed to and we could evaluate uh, in, in a larger scale. We did some games during the pandemic with the United Nations and the World Health Organization called Go Viral, which is based on the same principle uh, during elections with political misinformation um, with the Department of Homeland Security in, in the U.S., um, and, you know, here you see basically what happens in the game. You know, you you make use of weakened doses of the strategies. This is impersonation. So you're impersonating Donald Trump, for example, here. Uh, you can see the Twitter handles manipulated. Most people don't notice this on uh, the first time around. Uh, it's very interactive. So, you know, people interact with you. You start you create your own echo chamber um, and you learn about some of these tactics. In fact, they're polarization, impersonation. So impersonating doctors, celebrities, politicians floating conspiracy theories, trolling, um, fear-mongering. And so people are inoculated against uh, all of these strategies. Now, we had lots of papers kind of evaluating this approach and how the long-term effectiveness of it, but we still weren't quite there yet in terms of, of scaling this approach and implementing so it. Game. Um, and so what we did is we started building computational models of how you could actually scale this, kind of like an epidemiological model um, of, of what happens if enough people in a network are, are inoculated against misinformation, do you get herd immunity? Um, and we had some, some positive answers there, but it really depends on how far you can scale this. So we decided to team up with um, Google and uh, test this in the wild. And these are some of the latest results that I'm excited to show you today. So what we did with Google is Google said, look, these games are fun, but they're 20 minutes, 15 minutes on social media. You know, you have a minute with people, 30 seconds. So we needed to do something that we could scale. So we created videos. These videos follow this inoculation script very closely. So there's a warning that people may be targeted with misinformation. Then 
They are exposed to a weakened dose of some of these strategies, for example, scapegoating minority groups. So scapegoating is a technique that was used a lot during the pandemic. Uh, I think Donald Trump saying Chinese virus, uh, for example. Um, and then people get the microdose or the examples of, of how they can, you know, examples of how this occurs in the wild. Um, and that's sort of the inoculation uh, process. Um, so we recently published this paper, which had six lab studies and one uh, field study. I'm not going to go through all of these studies, but I'll, I just want to give you the basic gist of how these studies work and, and what our findings are. So basically, people were randomized to either the inoculation group, and they were shown one of these videos um, for about a minute and a half, or a control group, and so an unrelated video, I think it was about freezer burn. Um, and then they got items to rate, either manipulative or non-manipulative, and then they went through the um, the rest of the survey. So I don't have time to show these videos here, but they're, let me explain the concept to you. So it's about 30 seconds. They're fun. They're animated. Um, and what they do is they look at some of these techniques um, in a completely kind of inactivated context. Um, so when you work with social media companies, they're very hesitant to touch on any real world issues. They don't want to take any risks. Um, and so what we did was we have a, a video, for example, on false dichotomies. So you, Google owns YouTube, right? And so they identified that, you know, on YouTube, the problem is not so much that there's news headlines because there are videos on YouTube, right? But there's a lot of political gurus using misinformation strategies to get people into more extremist modes of thinking. So for example, they, they will use emotional language or fear mongering, or they will uh, present false dichotomies to people, um, or, you know, they'll make use of, of fake experts or conspiracy theories. Um, and so the false dichotomy one, an example of that is, oh, either you join ISIS or you're not a good Muslim, for example. So there's obviously more than those two options. But when people in the moment are targeted with the false dichotomy, it tends to be, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, OK, maybe that makes ma makes sense. Um, and so what we try to do in these videos is pre-bunk these techniques. So what we do is we show people a clip from Star Wars, Revenge of the Sith. And so this is Obi-Wan Kenobi talking to Luke uh, Skywalker. And he says, you know, either you're with me or you're my enemy. And then Obi-Wan says, only a Sith deals in absolutes. Um, and so this is a completely uh, a safe context, but it's the exact same false dichotomy that's used in real world sort of, sort of issues. So that's the weakened dose that we present to people. And then we test them with, with actual items. So, you know, why give illegal immigrants access to social services? We should help, you know, uh, homeless Americans instead. Um, now, the non-manipulative version of this would read, and this is actually taken from social media, um, can we address both the immigrant uh, access to social services and the, our domestic homelessness problem, right? There's no reason why you can't address both. So this is a false dichotomy. Um, politicians are doing important work, uh, but they're really parasites. They feed off others. They create no wealth of their own. Uh, this is the scapegoating technique. So here they're scapegoating politicians. And again, we're not concerned about true fake, but about these sort of toxic conversations that are that are happening online that make use of these manipulative strategies. Okay, so here's some of the results, and, and that's where I'll, I'll, uh, I'll end soon. Um, for emotional language, incoherence, false dichotomy, scapegoating, um, you have here discernment, which is a variable that subtracts people's ability to detect real news from fake news in this context. Um, and so we want discernment to go up. Um, so you can see here that people are better able to recognize these techniques. Um, here's the, the fake news or the fake technique recognition. People have higher confidence in their abilities. They find it more trustworthy. And for most of the techniques, not all of them, they indicated lower willingness to, um, to share. Um, so this was, uh, here are the effect sizes if people want to see that. I mean, Cohen's D is kind of an academic metric of, of the effect size, but I'll show you a different effect size uh, in a second. Um, people said, this is great, um, but what about on social media? So we got YouTube to actually allow us to test this approach in the wild on YouTube. You know, when you get those annoying ads on YouTube and you can't skip them, this is where our pre-bunking video Video would be entered. Um, and what happened was that people were randomly exposed. So we had about a million and campaign with about a million uh, views on these videos on YouTube. Then they allowed us to randomly select 30% for one survey question on the YouTube platform within 24 hours of being exposed to the video. The median exposure time was about 18 hours. So it was not directly after. So in this ad space, you were exposed to the video. And then within 24 hours, you got one of those surveys on YouTube. 
Interestingly, they only use those surveys for companies for like brand recognition, but we're able to hijack this for scientific purposes to actually see if people can now identify these techniques. And you can see an example here. This was during the World Cup. You can see, you know, the countdown of these these ads and the, the surveys. Um, so what did we find in the wild on YouTube when people are, you know, distracted? We found that these videos boost people by about 5% in their technique recognition. That's much smaller than in the lab, uh, but it's still, you know, it's still pretty good. If you look at brand recognition numbers, uh, companies are generally happy, you know, with a 1% boost in brand recognition. They spend millions of dollars on that. So 5% boost um, was, was pretty favorable. Uh, and YouTube is now rolling out this, this approach uh, on a larger scale with, uh, with Google, for example, on the uh, um, Ukrainian uh, immigration crisis. Um, so what they're doing here is they're modeling the inoculation process in a video. So these, these are available in different languages. So again, rather than a fact check, these are people having a conversation about how you can inoculate people at home. So what happens here is they say, oh, you know, there are all these refugees from Ukraine coming to Europe. They're going to steal jobs. It's going to be terrible. And then the other person says, hey, do you know about this technique called scapegoating? It's when you pick a group of people, usually a minority, and you blame them for all of our problems. And this is a technique that's common in a lot of misinformation. And then they have a conversation and inoculate each other against this technique. And it also models how people can do this uh, at home. We just have a guide out today uh, with Google and BBC, a practical guide to pre-bunking. If people want to implement this, it goes through you know, all of the steps. You know. What misinformation do you want to pre-bunk? Who's your audience? What are the right measurements for you? Um, so it's a very detailed sort of practical guide. Uh, we have one uh, with NATO as well uh, for, uh, you know, during conflicts. Um, I'm not going to go into the Ukraine example, but uh, but there's some information on, on that. Um, Twitter was pre-bunking until they all got fired by Elon Musk. Um, we're doing some pre-bunking with Facebook at the moment around uh, climate change in, in very much the same way. Um, and the last thing I'll say, inoculation.science is where you can find all of our materials for free. It's all open. Um, and uh, my own propaganda, if people are interested in this research, uh, I have a book described. Sorry, I went a little over, but hope it, hopefully it was useful. Thanks so much. It was great. Thanks so much, Sander. It's always fascinating to listen to you and all of your great research you've done. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in that. Uh, and I think I want to turn to the audience, although one thing that really stuck in my mind was, you know, your comment at the beginning that once you see a falsehood, it lingers in our minds, even if you've seen a correction, which is a really, really horrible thing to think about as we try to um, address the negative effects of this type of content online. I am not on site in Addis Ababa, although I see a very full room. Uh, my colleague Hannah Pawlik is there, and I'm going to pass to her if there's any comments in the room uh, for Sander. Please raise your hand if any of you have a question. And if you are sitting behind, you'll need to go closer to the microphones. And Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Sandra. Uh, we are in the, same, in the same area, and I am a social psychologist too. Uh, what I raised in the question is when such kind of uh, study have uh, took place, how cross-cultural issue addressed? And uh, the next is, I think truth is relative. So, uh, how this fact or uh, truths and untruths try to check and try to control and try to have universal consensus on uh, the global connection and the global internet connection and internet community? This is my question. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the global question and the different. It's a very good question. Um, so, so some of these pre-bunks uh, are being adapted in, in different languages, but it's not so straightforward because. Some of the jokes, some of the humor, it will be different in different countries. And so it's not just a matter of putting, we've started to put subtitles in, but, but that's not ideal because ideally we really want to adapt it to different cultures. That's why we've teamed up with people who have expertise in that. So we work with the BBC Media Action Lab and they do a lot of research in the global south, for example, also in Africa. Um, and so they're able to work with local partners in, in different uh, continents to adapt this approach and, and work with local universities and organizations to make sure that, that it fits the right context. 
Uh, we're doing something similar with Google uh, with our games. We've also we team up with local organizations. So we work with partners in Ukraine, for example, on the on the Ukrainian and Russian versions of our games. Uh, we have versions in pretty much every language at the moment for the games um, uh, because we work with, with local partners. Um, but, you know, studying the, the global efficacy is, um, is is a good question. So in a lot of Western European contexts, we find that the results are, are pretty similar. Uh, but then, you know, we did one intervention in rural India, for example, that uh, didn't really work out as we had hoped because the digital literacy levels were just very different from what you would see in, in urban areas. And so we really had to adapt our intervention. So I would say, and this is also what we mentioned in our recent guide, that you do really have to carefully adapt these interventions uh, for different cultural contexts and test them and maybe even pre-test them sometimes. That's what we tend to do um, to see if they're appropriate. And then to answer your second question uh, quickly, um, which I think was uh, was about truth is relative. Um, you know, you, you can do issue-based pre-bunks. So there, you know, you inject people with the facts beforehand and it's about a specific fact and you take a stance and you say what the truth is, uh, or usually based around some scientific consensus, that's possible. In scaling this, we've taken the approach of not talking about specific facts or claims, but rather just inoculating people against these underlying tactics that are that have been used for over 2000 years in, in Aristotle's time uh, and they're still used today things like scapegoating false dilemmas um, um, conspiracy theories polarizing groups um, so we typically don't tell people what they need to believe or what the truth is we just tell them these are the techniques that are used across all sorts of information to mislead people uh, and we help people spot those techniques and we find that that's a very non-polarizing way uh, to get people to think about this idea of, of pre-bunking. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have to do an issue-based thing. So, for example, during elections, you might have specific issues that need to be addressed. Um, but, yeah, I think I agree if you can, we kind of want to sidestep that truth debate. Yes. Um, well, first, uh, maybe we can take both questions and then uh, we'll have a reply for both questions. Sure, thank you. Uh, Richard Bambals, Head of Strategic Communications for the Government Office of Latvia. Uh, first, I wanted to say hi to Molly. Uh, we met last time when I was in Paris at the OECD. I really appreciate your work and I also appreciate the work of Sanders and, and, and his team, uh, especially on We have adapted uh, two of the three games you mentioned also to Latvian language, both Go Viral and Harmony Square. Uh, to this end, I wanted also to share um, uh, share uh, share our experience uh, in uh, and our observations that uh, while one game uh, particularly go viral uh, did very well uh, it was picked up by the audience very well it was played very well and uh, we saw very good results uh, last year when the covid was a thing uh, really at least in europe and uh, however this year when we were in the run-up to our parliamentary elections, to our general elections, we also uh, d made a decision to adapt Harmony Square. And this game somehow was not really picked up. So this actually comes to my question, whether in your career, in your observations, you have observed that one of the three games is doing better than the others, or some uh, promotional tactics of the games maybe work better than others, and it, it could you elaborate a bit on this if you have any, anything to share? And while I'm here, also, what I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of your work on, on, on the games and short videos. I just want maybe to have a sneak peek. What, what else is cooking in, in the kitchen, so to say, behind the, uh, behind the scenes? What, what's the next thing after, after short videos, after games? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we'll thanks so much. And that's maybe directly the second question, and then that will be the end of the questions from here, the room. Uh, thank you. And my name is Owen Bennett. I work with Ofcom, which is the UK communications regulator. I have two specific questions around deployment. One is, does your research suggest whether this model of pre-bunking could be deployed beyond just pure play disinformation to think particularly about like, harmful content to children, like self-harm content? Or is it just about things where there is a fact of the matter? And secondly, in, in the collaborations you've had with online service providers, have they raised any questions about legal or regulatory risks which would make deployment more difficult? And I ask that because obviously for this to work, they have to effectively be, in some respects, promoting uh, disinformation. So I, I, I'm curious whether they have any 
concerns about that. Thank you. Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, maybe I'll start with, chronologically with the, with the first. Um, yes, and I remember John Rosenbeek may have worked with the Latvia team also to, to, to do those translations. That's great. I mean, we love getting feedback on this also. Um, we've... Um, um, I don't know why why Harmony Square was um, less effective. I, you know, my sense is we are making some slight changes, in fact, to Harmony Square um, at the moment to try to update a little bit. Um, we've generally received very positive feedback about Go Viral during the pandemic in different countries, so that, that seems to work well. We try to improve our interventions, you know, when we get feedback that uh, in some cultural context they were less popular. Um, it, 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 it also depends on how much investment there is with the rollout. Um, and I will say it also it also generally just depends on the partner. So, you know, bad news, which is our original intervention, which was not done with any partners except um, the university, um, remains one of the more, most popular ones and the, the most, uh, you know, continually evaluated ones. Um, but, I, you know, we have noticed that when we team up with external organizations, uh, there can be a bit more criticism sometimes because people have conspiracy theories about the WHO, for example, or they have uh, feelings about the government. So, you know, Harmony Square was done with the U.S. State Department, but, you know, a lot of people, when they don't like the party that's in power, people are going to be distrustful of anything coming out of the government. Um, and so we have to deal with this added layer of who is delivering the inoculation. And so we've been experimenting with, may, may, well, maybe when you know, actors that that are contested in some form, uh, maybe there's better, quote unquote, virtual needles or better ways of delivering uh, the intervention by other parties that, that, that resonate more across the political spectrum. Um, and so we've been thinking about who, you know, who, who is the ideal person to, or, or organization to kind of deliver an inoculation. So I'm not sure how Harmony Square was promoted, but what I'm saying is that sometimes we can feel that there's uh, less, you know, less take uh, less uptake in the interventions if um, you know people are slightly skeptical about the source of uh, of who's distributing it. Um, and so bad news is very popular because it's you know very organic and not promoted by any organization. But then again, you know the world of go viral did really well despite some conspiracies about the WHO and the United Nations. Um, so it, it really it really depends. And for us, sometimes it's also hard to know what makes a cultural adaptation effective and and when it's not so effective. Um, but yeah, it's very useful to receive that feedback on new directions very quickly. Uh, we feel we have enough games now, so we're trying to just optimize them. And based on the feedback that we're getting, we try to optimize them and do the translations right. Um, we're same with the videos. Um, the next thing I think we're thinking about are deep fakes. So how can we inoculate people against deep fakes? So deep fakes, you know, they're there, but they're not super prominent yet. But now is the time to start inoculating against deep fakes. So that's what we're working on. And then two is what we can do for other platforms like TikTok. So we have videos, but they're not going to be suitable for TikTok. It's, it's just a different way of, of how people interact. And so we're, we're trying to think of, of how to engage that type of generation on, on TikTok and how to do even shorter, uh, more scale, even more scalable versions. So that, so those are two things that, um, that we're working on um, at the moment. Then for the second uh, gentleman from uh, Ofcam, um, self-harm, I've, um, um, you know, this approach lends itself well to any area where you can discern uh, techniques. So, you know, we've applied it to extremism and radicalization, for example, because there are recruitment strategies. There are stages in which people are recruited into a cult or into an extremist organization. We can break down those stages, expose people to controlled, weakened doses of them and refute them. Uh, and, you know, that's where it works well. It doesn't work so well when there's no systematic approach that we can break down uh, and or techniques that are, can be identifiable. So I don't know enough about the sort of self-harm online space and, you know, things like uh, how, how that happens. But, you know, if there are systematic ways in which people are exposed to, to content that leads to self-harm that you can break down into tactics that people can be inoculated against, I think it could be useful. But if not, then, you know, sometimes it doesn't lend itself in, in a very straightforward way. Um, um, if there's issues or in terms of the issue based pre bunk, um, if there's obviously if there's facts around this that you can use, that also works. Um, but I don't know enough about sort of self harm, uh, the self harm literature to, 
be able to say off the top of my head whether this is going to work or not. Uh, but we are teaming up with uh, the BBC on doing a youth campaign and to try to to try to promote this this idea among uh, uh, among teenagers uh, across a variety of issues in a big kind of developmental campaign to see if we can prevent toxic content uh, more more generally. Um, and whether platform providers have legal uh, issues, uh, yes. So so the reason why um, when we work with with Facebook or Google, the reason why we work with them um, is because they they don't want to do weekend doses of actual controversial issues that you sometimes have to do. So that's why we created this sort of completely inactivated strain. Um, so the the weekend dose people get in our work with social media companies are th are clips from the on the Simpsons, Star Wars. Um, we're not actually exposing them to a weekend dose of the misinformation because social media companies do identify that as a potential risk to them. Um, and um, and that's that's why we've taken came up with that approach, um, which is basically risk free. So when you do the pre bunking, I think there's various strategies you can take, you can do the, the a weekend dose of the actual misinformation, you can step back and focus on the strategies, or you can use a completely neutralized dose if you really need a complete risk free sort of strategy. Um, so that those are the layers that we've come up with. I see from Molly that I need to, to, to silence myself now. So thanks so much. I could listen to you all day, but we've got so many uh, other great speakers I've got to get to. But thank you so, so, so much for that. Uh, and just to plus one on the whole translation issue, that's extremely complicated. We're translating something into Hebrew. I've had three professional native speakers translate the same thing three different ways. It's extremely complicated. Um, so thank you very much. We'll move into the panel part uh, of our workshop. Uh, and we'll hear from all of our panelists before moving to questions from the audience. So please do uh, stay tuned and save up your questions. Uh, first up, we have Julie Inman Grant, who's connecting very late at night from Australia. And we're so grateful to have you here. And thank you for doing that. Um, Julie is Australia's e-safety commissioner. And in this role, Julie leads the world's first government regulatory agency committed to keeping its citizens safer online. And Julie, from the perspective of the Australian eSafety Commission's work, you've de developed many innovative practical approaches, programs, initiatives. We've talked about some of them uh, before to address online harms and risks. And in, in your experience, it'd be great to hear, you know, what works and what doesn't. Uh, do you see any differences in the impacts uh, of the interventions on children versus adults? This is getting to a question we see in the chat, uh, as well as men versus women. So Julie, we're happy to hear from you next. Thank you. Great. Well, well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the fascinating presentation, Sander. I'm going to take a somewhat different approach. No brain science and hopefully no brain overload. <laughs> um, but certainly countering the negative and making way for the positive is really at the heart of our mission um, as the eSafety Commissioner. And of course, our overall goal is to help keep all Australians safer and have more having more positive experiences online. So with the focus of our workshop today on fighting untruths online, it really draws out an essential aspect of the challenges faced by regulators, service providers, as well as people around the globe. Now, it's been said that the internet is nothing more than a reflection of society, a mirror to the world that we live in. And if we don't like what we see reflected, perhaps it's society we need to fix, not the mirror. So after all, we're not born with racist, misogynistic, or extremist views. We learn them. But there's no doubt that the power of the internet is magnifying and further entrenching these points of view. And we can and should acknowledge the many benefits that online services provide in our day-to-day -day lives. But I think we'd all agree that there are also costs. And in the digital age, it's far easier to produce and disseminate harmful and misleading content and to spread untruths faster and further. And it's this misleading content that is drawing some users into this online house of mirrors where they can't tell the difference between truth and illusion. And this is where I really hold fears for the future world of VR, AR, and MR, where the real and the virtual are designed to be blurred. And in the area of deep fakes, as Sander mentioned, GANs and generative AI, where we will truly not be able to discern what is real and what is fake through the naked eye. And we know that detection tools are lagging behind the significant advantages in, in these obvious obfuscating technologies. 
So another question that's difficult to answer is, how much of this support is orchestrated interference? And how much is due to algorithms promoting negative content to make platforms sticky, knowing that outrage and conflict sells? And really, how much is a true reflection of deeper fault lines across society? So as e-safety commissioner, I'm particularly concerned about online intrusion and abuse being used to silence brave voices who could add diverse perspectives to our public discourse. Now, of course, while free speech is vital to the health of any modern democratic society, there's been a lot of talk lately about free speech absolutism. And certainly, if you allow targeted online abuse and harm to proliferate, silencing already marginalized voices and restricting online participation by those who are targeted, I think we all suffer. Now, eSafety's research, as well as the seven years of complaints data we have um, in interfacing with the public on a daily basis, demonstrate that online harassment is intersectional and it disproportionately targets women, First Nations Australians, people with a disability, and those from the LGBTIQ community, and from those of culturally diverse backgrounds. And while more overt operations designed to shift elected elections have been in the public spotlight, one of our growing concerns is with the escalation of online information operations. So highly organized but subtle campaigns targeting influential individuals with systemic but diffuse trolling. And again, this is designed to intimidate and silence. And we know with pylons and this kind of coordinated information communications, it's the aggregate harm that impacts people over time. So in Australia, we've recently seen this uh, play out with state-based actors targeting journalists, researchers, and human rights activists. And so putting the online and offline safety of their targets at this intersection of harms where online abuse, misinformation, and disinformation meet. We were set up seven years ago when the Australian government recognized the growing risk of online harms and established the eSafety Commissioner as the world's first dedicated online regulator. And so in regulating digital platforms and services, we work closely with other regulators as well, like the Australian Communications and Media Authority, which currently oversees Australia's voluntary disinformation and misinformation code. But our efforts to keep citizens safer online are focused through three main lenses, prevention, protection, and what I call proactive and systemic change. Now our work to prevent online harms occurring in the first place is supported through research and building that evidence base, education and awareness raising programs. So from a young age, we aim to give our citizens the critical reasoning skills they need to discern the real from the fade avoiding risky online situations, knowing how to seek help, and to develop the digital confidence to be safe, resilient, and positive participants in the online world. We often talk about um, the four R's, respect, responsibility, uh, building digital resi resilience, and critical reasoning skills. And we base this approach on a growing body of evidence that we can so that we can deliver fit for purpose programs that are responsive to the needs of diverse groups and communities. So for example, we've seen the chilling effect of online violence on political ambitions, engagement of women and girls, decreasing their presence in political life. So we have a program called Women in the Spotlight or WITS, which seeks to redress this imbalance and it provides uh, advice and support along with social media self-defense training that empowers women and girls to stay online and participate in democratic processes. We also know that meaningful societal challenge does take time. And until the online winds of change really start to blow, people suffering online harm will continue to reach out for help and protection. So it's worth mentioning under Australia's Online Safety Act, which came into to play this January, we operate a number of world first schemes to protect citizens from online harms, which also protects their ability to safely participate in our digital democracy. So every day, eSafety investigators are at the coalface helping Australians experiencing serious online abuse, from child cyberbullying to the sharing of intimate images online without consent to our new adult cyber abuse scheme, which also covers things like cyber stalking and doxing. 
All of these are designed to protect individuals from menacing, harassing, and offensive content intended to inflict serious harm, because that's how harm plays out on social media, dating, and gaming sites. We also work to combat illegal and restricted content on a daily basis, such as child sexual exploitation material and material that promotes or advocates terrorist acts. So through these schemes, we support individuals by asking in some cases compelling through the use of our legal powers, social media platforms and websites to take down abusive and harmful content within 24 hours, meeting a specific legislative threshold. We do not assess the content for truth or falsity. We do not adjudicate de defamation or harm to reputation, and we're not set up to proactively police the internet. Instead, we operate as an important safety net. Most of our schemes are report-based and require a complaint first to the online service. And then if it is not actioned, and we know that context and volume means a lot of reports fall through the cracks, so people can come to eSafety so we can advocate on their behalf. But we've also been given some game-changing new tools to target systemic safety issues as part of our focus on proactive change. Industry associations have recently submitted new codes designed to regulate the availability of illegal content on online services. I'm currently considering whether or not these codes should be registered and whether industry standards should be determined. And these new codes and st or standards will work hand in hand with our powers under the basic online safety expectations to help create an umbrella of protections for Australians online. We're currently reviewing responses for the first round of legal notices we've issued under this law to Apple, Meta, Microsoft, Snap, and Omegle, asking what they are doing or not doing to protect their users from online harm, particularly high risk, um, uh, high impact harms, including child sexual exploitation. So this is a potent transparency and accountability measure, considering that most of the transparency reporting we've seen from industry to date has been what I think might be characterized as selective and uneven. Because um, I, I think if we're really serious about really moving the dial towards a safer and a more civil online world, we really need a revolution, not an incremental evolution. And the catalyst for this revolution must be a renewed focus on safer product design. So just like the safety and design standards set down for industries like car manufacturers or consumer goods, we need similar rules and standards for tech, the technology industry also. So eSafety has been leading a global charge to shift responsibility back onto the tech sector for putting user safety at the core of product design and development by assessing risks and embedding protections up front with the help of our safety by design principles and risk assessment tools. We're also continually scanning for new and evolving online threats, putting these under the Microsofts so that we can strengthen our response because we know that technology is always going to outpace the law and policy. So we're about to release an in-depth look at the impact of recommender systems and algorithms, which have long been suspected of leading users down rabbit holes of polarizing content and stifling balanced debate and discourse. So to the extent that algorithms serve as an engine for discovery and that our data and our preferences serve as the fuel, we will need more algorithmic transparency too to understand the paths technology companies may be leading us down. And in the online safety space, we're also seeing more jurisdictions joining Australia and setting up their own laws and regulators to protect citizens online. So eSafety has come together uh, with regulators from the UK, including um, Owen from Ofcom in, in the room there. Um, Ireland and Fiji to form a new global online safety regulators network, which we anticipate will soon swell in numbers. Now, this growing momentum gives me a great deal of optimism for the future, because if we truly hope to fix these fundamental global problems, we all need to join forces in a concerted and coordinated effort. I hope that gives you a basic um, overview and a different perspective of how we're approaching online harms, including um, misinformation and disinformation uh, from, from a different perspective and vantage point.
Julie, that that was great. Thank thank you so much. I, I took a, a lot away from that. Uh, one, the need to develop uh, critical thinking skills, which is something we're working on here. Worries about extended reality, uh, mental health online, which uh, which we're al also working on, and kind of recalling what Sanders said, the need to embed safety up front to inoculate in advance that this is all kind of um, coming together, I think. So thank you uh, very much. We'll take questions uh, at the end. Uh, now I'd like to, to give the floor to Rehobot Ayalu, who's a professional fact checker based in Addis Ababa. She's also a consultant and a fact checking trainer on countering disinformation. And I was wondering, uh, and I know you're in the room, which, which is great, from the perspective of a very seasoned fact checker who fights against untruths online daily, how important is fact checking given what Sander mentioned in the beginning that we can't fact check everything, there's just too much of this content. Uh, what do you see as kind of the best modalities and its limitations, particularly for non-Anglophone countries uh, in combating untruths online? Okay, thank you, Molly. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so, to begin with, the importance of fact-checking is not questionable because we all know that in this digital era and in the, as the access of internet is uh, increasing, the spread of disinformation is also increasing hand in hand. So the importance of fact-checkers who debunk those issues that are circulating online is really important. Uh, but despite the, the, that, importance and despite how much the impact of fact checking is online uh, there are a lot of uh, limitations and challenges that fact checkers are facing uh, <coughs> uh, all, all around the world the major i can say the major uh, challenge that fact checkers face is the lack of access to information especially when we talk about uh, Africa uh, specifically, uh, the lack of uh, timely and credible information is uh, the major cause of the disinformation by itself and also makes the fact-checking work really difficult. Uh, the other one is the, aware, the, the, the lack of awareness and the uh, low media literacy rate of the public is also the other challenge because when we talk about disinformation, when we talk about untruths online, most people are not aware about it, and especially in Ethiopia and Africa as well. So the lack of awareness about the problem itself is really challenging because if we don't know the problem is there, uh, we can come up with uh, a long-term so long solution. So when we uh, talk about uh, low media literacy, uh, it's really critical because especially in developing countries like Ethiopia, uh, most people think that Facebook is the internet in general and anything that comes from Facebook and the internet is true. So changing the mindset and the, the way that people perceive those social media platforms is, uh, I can say, the major uh, task we have. So in addition to that, even though those uh, fact checkers are, who are trying to uh, do their best to, to counter the disinformation are working their best. Uh, their visibility and their, their, their reach is really questionable because uh, since most people don't know about that they exist or the importance or everything, uh, their impact can be also questionable and it's really challenging because uh, we're working uh, to monitor every conversation online. We're working to debunk uh, most of the violent and toxic conversation, but uh, there our reach and visibility is really low, so which makes our impact uh, really questionable. Uh, this also leads us to the major point I want to talk about today, uh, which is the lack of attention from those big tech companies and the social media platforms. When I say uh, lack of attention, I mean in allocation of resource, in inclusivity, uh, uh, about transparency about their efforts uh, or how many moderators they have for uh, each countries or 
willingness to co collaborate with local initiatives as well. Uh, for example, we all remember uh, the issue uh, about Facebook. Uh, Francis uh, Hogan, I, I, I think I pronounced that her name right. So uh, we, we all remember how Facebook was being criticized for its negligence and its fail uh, to moderate contents which are hateful and which are violence inciting and also which are uh, false information in Ethiopia. And that uh, failure to moderate those content really uh, participate in fueling the conflict on the ground, especially in the war in Tigray and other conflicts in Ethiopia. And that's an example of how those uh, platforms and those big tech companies are uh, negligent of those develop, developing countries in uh, allocating more resources. So the negligence so that uh, there is deep ge geographic and linguistic inequality. Uh, for example, uh, there are more than 80 languages in Ethiopia, uh, and also there are five major languages that are spoken in Ethiopia, but uh, we, we even don't know how many of the languages are Facebook uh, moderating or uh, how many people have Facebook to moderate those contents uh, from, for like 7 billion uh, Facebook users in Ethiopia, we don't know how many content moderators there are. And there are only two fact-checking organizations that works independently for Facebook, uh, who has only five fact-checkers summed up. So, uh, five fact checkers for uh, around 7 billion social media users and not only that, the conversation on Facebook and uh, social media doesn't stay there. It, it impacts the, the situation and the conflicts and everything on the ground. So it's really uh, co questionable. So when we talk about the uh, inclusivity of language, uh, only few percent of Facebook users are believed to be English speakers, but more than 85% of its uh, misinformation spending uh, resource goes to English language. So only like 15% of the, the resource are going to the other language internationally. So this also shows that, that uh, how developing countries and how at-risk countries are uh, neglected neglected as well. Uh, I believe uh, the other challenge, fact checkers, not only uh, in Ethiopia, but also in Africa, or uh, in general, are facing is the question of sustainability. Uh, because uh, as, you, as I said, uh, the access to information and those negligence from the platforms are making our job hard. But at the same time, uh, we don't know when we are going to shut down or something because we don't have the resource to continue our work. We rely on uh, funding and grants and uh, donation from other organizations. So the sustainability of uh, those fact checkers and those s small startups and fact checking initiatives, especially the local ones, uh, the small is really questionable. So. Since there is also shortage in resource, in expertise, and also uh, in support, uh, we are all facing the problem that even though fact-checking is important to, to, to solve uh, the problem or to counter disinformation, uh, we, are st we are still in lack. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm trying to use my time, so I, I think I'm <laughs> running so fast. So. For example, uh, there are a lot of uh, civil society organizations, there are a lot of media houses, media development organizations, even the platforms that themselves and governments are trying to, to work on countering disinformation by, on their own and not working together. This also uh, creates a big gap in uh, resource allocation and also uh, to come up with a long-term solution for this uh, worldwide uh, problem. So, uh, in general, just every sto stakeholder is by their own uh, and every resource is 
being handled by their own. So lack of collaboration and lack of support from each other is also one of the reasons that uh, fact-checking is uh, facing a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, last but not least, I want to talk about uh, the most neglected uh, topic about fact-checking, which is the mental health issue and well-being of the fact-checkers, because uh, as fact-checkers, we face uh, a lot of contents that normally we wouldn't have if we are not a fact-checker. There are a lot of toxic conversation, there are a lot of uh, violent content, and also there are a lot of uh, lie and everything and we don't have especially in developing countries like ethiopia we don't have the access to uh, support on how to handle those uh, those contents and how to uh, keep our mental health uh, safe so uh, it's one of the untalked about uh, untalked uh, story of fact checkers but also it's one of the most critical uh, challenge that we're facing individually and uh, in general as a fact checkers. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, uh, I just want to say that we are all uh, trying to uh, solve this worldwide uh, problem uh, and the lack of collaboration between each stakeholders is one of the major uh, gaps we have to fill and uh, I think we can come up with a better solution together. At a, at a time. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That that was really helpful. I think you really well highlighted the challenges you face. Five fact checkers for seven billion social media users. Issues around lack of, of resources, which are real. Raising this this new issue about mental health of fact checkers in developing countries, which is something I hadn't thought about, as well as this issue of fact checking in uh, non-Anglophone languages. And I think that's a, a great sort of segue to, to our next speaker, which is uh, Pablo Fernandez, uh, who's executive director and editor-in-chief at Cheque Chequeado. Pablo is also a professor at the University of Buenos Aires and its research team on technology and media among many other important uh, roles. And I know you've gotten up very early to be with us, Pablo. I'm very grateful. Thank you uh, for that. And we'll look forward to hearing a bit from you about the um, Check, Check A Bot AI tool that facilitates fact checking in Spanish. And it would also be great to have a little bit of your views about um, the right balance between human intervention and digital technologies in the, in the fight against untruths online. Yeah, thanks, Molly. Can you hear me properly? Perfect. I will share something, but really simple. I guess it works. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, perfect. So, I mean, Chequeado, for us, it's really important to be here because, as other panelists have said, um, things are different in the South, in developing countries. and. If we have challenge in developed countries, imagine what we have in developing countries. We are not only talking about the problems of how to solve misinformation, but that's uh, sometimes we have problems accessing databases, getting replies from the government. So even getting to the false or true <laughs> ratings is really complicated in some countries. Luckily, that is not the case in Argentina right now, but it used to be. We, we have, when we started, and that, that's why I'm showing this slide, in 2010 we started, and, and that moment, the, the, um, being tweaked by the government, so we, we weren't able to, to trust the inflation rate. Um, that's, the, that's when we started, so a part of our methodology was embedded having alternative sources in every fact checks, for example. And that is something that, that we brought afterwards to the whole Latin American region. Just in case, we are the first non-profit fact-checking organization in Latin America and the Southern Hemisphere. We have been working since 2010 in this. Um, but when, what we want to highlight is that we have a multidimensional approach. And now we are getting to technology. But the, the important thing is that we don't think that the, there is a silver bullet. 
we think that the solution comes from different optics. One is media, journalism, fact-checking, but also we are focused on education. We talked about this in the panel before. And we have been working with this in, in high school, but also in universities. Then we work uh, measuring impact, trying to see what, what is important about what we do. That's why we were really paying attention to what Sander says about the banking, sorry, pre-banking. And that is something that we are going to test in the near future also. And then, and it, that is the core of, of this talk, we work a lot with innovation and technology. And why? Because as Sander said, usually fact checks take a lot to, to be written. Yes, sometimes a lie starts spreading and then you have to wait two, four, five days or even a week. So what we built is Checkabot. Checkabot is an AI tool that helps us to find what to check fast in Spanish. And now we are doing some, some development also in, in Portuguese. And why this is important? Because as you know, the, the, the lie or the, or the false claim is spread really fast. So we need to be faster. And how can we be faster if we have limited resources, as my fellow panelist says? So we, we try to work in, in two, in two um, dimensions. One is in a network. This is Latam Chequea, that is the network that we have in, in the region that was very important, for example, for covering COVID and the anti-vaccination movement. And just in case I was in Kenya a couple of weeks ago, because in Africa, uh, they have the Africa Fact Summit and it's amazing. So e everyone in this community of fact checkers are working in, in communities because sometimes the problems are really similar are around different countries. And the other dimension is this, the check about. So now there are seven countries in, the, in our region using these tools that help us find claims really fast. In Argentina, just, just an example, we are able to find claims in more than 30 media outlets, presidential speeches, Congress speeches, YouTube channels, Twitter lists in seconds, in seconds. So that was something that in the past was just a dream. We 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 thought five years ago that it was important to be paying attention all the time to four media outlets, and now we are paying attention to more than thirty media outlets. So that that is one thing. Then we are able to reply faster through WhatsApp, that is huge in Latin America. We are able to monitor not only every social network, but seeing in only one dashboard: Basumo, Crowd Tangle, Twitter Trends, Google Trends. So everything from one point of view, and that for us is really important. We are also able to reply in real time to people. And one thing that is also key is that we, we started developing this with only one developer. So that's why I want to talk about this just for 10 seconds. This is something that can be done even in the global South. You can develop technology. You don't need a team of 50 people. It's something that with the right people, with passion and then and the right knowledge, they can build this kind of tools. Yes, we were lucky to have a developer that works with NLP, natural language processing, and then with AI. So, but afterwards, you need to pay attention to what the newsroom needs, what the fact checker needs. And that is also part of our work. We don't build technology per technology itself, but we build technology that we think and we ask the user if it's useful or not. So in a nutshell, just to, just to wrap it up, I want to highlight that Checkabout is, is done, was done, and is being developed in the Global South. In the beginning, it was a team of one <laughs> that was at the same time paying attention to the website to not, to not break. So this is something, again, that can be done. There's a lot of challenges uh, about language. And even with, with, with the Spanish being a language that is, is taught by millions, there are a lot less tools and libraries and technology than in English. So we need really to share the knowledge about this. And if everyone, if anyone in the, in the room wants to ask me something afterwards, you can write to me. Um, and also we need to be able to see what our colleagues needs because in, in the region, 
it's not the same what someone in Cuba needs, for example, that someone in Chile. So we need to be able to tweak the technology for them <clears throat> at the same time that we keep a, a similar core, just not to rebuild everything all the time. So in a nutshell, just for, for finishing, we think that we need a multidimensional approach for this. So again, journalism fact-checking, education, technology, and also working with the academy to measure impact of this and, and be all the time redefining what tools to use. So thanks for this, Molly. Thank you so much, Pablo. That 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 was great, and it reflects a lot of the the thinking we have at the OECD. We're also someone inspirational that, with the right people and technology, we we can make a difference and get it done. And I think that that's true. And I I share that. Um, I'd like to move uh, to our last panelist, but certainly not the least, who's Mark Erbach who is also connecting very early in the morning, but from Canada. So thank you, uh, Mark, for being with us. Mark is uh, a friend of the OECD for a long time. He's head of the Center of Expertise for the Digital Economy at Statistics Canada. He has an awful lot of experience uh, with innovative approaches for measuring uh, various aspects of digital transformation, including well-being, among other things. And Mark, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what Statistics Canada's efforts are to measure false and misleading content online and what we need to do to fill the measurement gaps. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, Molly, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to hear uh, the other speakers and, and all those different perspectives as well. Uh, so I, I think kind of in your opening remarks, we talked a little bit about the fact that we uh, getting any kind of indicators on this area is a real challenge. And um, this is identified as well in the OECD toolkit note, uh, kind of the who, what, where, when, and how this information is, is uh, kind of spreading is really challenging to get uh, good metrics on. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of what StatCan has done and sort of where we might go in the future with this. Um, but really that prevalence of misinformation and the importance to understanding how it impacts the lives of individuals, what they believe to be true and how it affects their behaviors is a real challenge that is currently facing statisticians, na national statistics organizations, and then policymakers as they seek accurate sources for this type of data uh, in order to make uh, proper decisions. Uh, so at Statistics Canada, uh, misinformation and trust in media are included as one of 16 indicators uh, under the good governance pillar of the quality of life framework uh, that has been established and adopted. Uh, however, we still lack an ongoing data source to support this indicator. Uh, early attempts to measure the phenomenon have been difficult uh, due to the challenges in explaining the concept and the information sought to respondents of, of survey questionnaires when we attempt to get it through uh, that sort of mechanism. Uh, although ad hoc data collection that is relevant to the indicator has been completed, it doesn't align directly uh, with the definition uh, under the quality of life framework. Uh, so nearly everyone, we're having this conversation today, I, I think we, we recognize that nearly everyone sees misinformation or claims to have, although this remains really difficult to measure since it, it really is a self-assessed phenomenon. Uh, these early attempts to measure misinformation uh, and the consumption of it have been challenging at best because while we can accept that everyone sees misinformation, only some may recognize it, and then others may judge accurate information to be false based on their own values or beliefs. So this set of circumstances makes questionnaire design very difficult and uh, potentially misleading. So as a result, uh, Statistics Canada has chosen to focus survey work to date on the activities that individuals take before sharing information with friends and family and the steps that they take to verify information found online, uh, rather than looking at uh, just the prevalence of misinformation or whether um, individuals have consumed it. Uh, so I'll talk about one very quickly here about one, one study that we did uh, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so in the summer of 2020, uh, Statistics Canada undertook a new questionnaire as part of a panel survey program 
uh, to better understand the degree to which Canadians were fact-checking news that they found online, how they verified the accuracy of that information, and whether they did that before they shared it online in other means with other friends or family. So this module asked only about information related to COVID-19, and we found that as a result, it was easier to have as a more focused set of questions than were attempted previously when we, um, uh, rather than attempting to uh, ask about kind of misinformation writ large, uh, by focusing it on one topic, we were able to kind of uh, design a module that made uh, more sense to the respondent. Uh, so this, along with a short recall period, uh, seemed to allow for more accurate reporting by respondents. And the results of this study uh, were quite significant. Uh, what we saw was that while nearly every respondent said that they had seen misinformation online, a much smaller percentage said that they always checked the accuracy of the information that they find online. Uh, so only about one in five Canadians mentioned that they, when they find information online, they always go and kind of make sure that what, what they've seen uh, makes sense. Uh, others were, were much less vigorous in always checking the accuracy of the information that they were finding. Uh, the most common reason identified um, by the 6% of Canadians who never verified the accuracy of the information uh, was that they uh, trusted the source uh, of, of the, of the uh, information. Uh, of the other reasons, 22% reported that they did not even think about checking the accuracy of the information. 20% didn't care about checking. 11% said they did not know how to check it. And 10% uh, just said that they didn't have the time to be checking it. So even if they chose to share this information, half of Canadians chose to share it with their friends and family networks without knowing whether it was accurate. Um, and we saw that with older Canadians, those over the age of 55, uh, this group was the most likely to share information that they found online about COVID-19 without uh, taking the step to check the accuracy of the statements before they did so. Uh, although the practices of verifying information online verify uh, varied by education level and age, uh, we saw that the results were very similar by gender. Uh, so despite this exercise demonstrating that surveys can be a valuable tool for measuring some practices and behaviors related to misinformation, it also demonstrated again uh, that surveys alone are not, a, um, uh, not, not an ideal solution for this type of measurement. Survey programs remain limited in their ability to, to, to um, determine the ability of individuals to spot mis misinformation, and they are not an effective tool in assessing the prevalence of misinformation that individuals are exposed to on a daily basis. So to this end, national statistical organizations must continue to explore new and novel means of fully capturing the phenomenon. At Statistics Canada, there has been some exploration with the use of an, uh, an app to capture information on the well-being of individuals. Uh, whereby they are able to capture their mood when prompted with an app on their phone that they voluntary, voluntarily download. Um, so one thing that we would like to look into is uh, the, uh, the usefulness of this type of application um, for, um, for data collection related to misinformation as well. Uh, this type of nearly real-time data collection could remove many of the issues related to the recall period, uh, which diminish the quality of data that is collected. Another method that has been discussed uh, internally as well is the gamification of data collection, uh, where respondents would need to attempt to identify misinformation through a type of online game, uh, providing data on the capacity of individuals to sort through different types of information. Uh, and, and this was really interesting to hear uh, Sander put forward some of those ideas this morning, um, and the work that they've done is, is, really, is really great to see as well. So I think uh, while we can agree that neither of these offer a silver bullet type solution to the development of indicators of this type, uh, they really can offer a step in the right direction. And uh, we've gone through this process before with sort of emerging new technology trends and, and new types of indicators like this, where we kind of have a bit of a breaking in period where we have to do some experimentation, uh, some exploration. But I think really as practitioners, it's really only through this exchange of lessons learned and these types of experimentation with data collection 
uh, that we'll be able to capture more relevant information and, and produce appropriate indicators for evidence-based policy making related to this important topic. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Mark. It was great to hear about um, more of the innovative approaches that CAN's taking the apps, uh, thinking about the gamified surveys, thinking that traditional surveys may not be the best approach in this area. I think I, sh I share that view. Um, so th thank you so so much for that. I, I want to give one last word to uh, my colleague Worthy Cho, who who's online. She's currently a law student at Harvard. Uh, she's formerly a data analyst in Meta's misinformation process operations unit, and she worked with us uh, for a little bit this summer on our own measurement quantification exercise. And I just, from someone who's been inside uh, looking at some of this stuff uh, uh, on a major platform, if you just had a couple thoughts uh, reacting to some of the panelists' presentations uh, before then, we don't have too much more time, but then we'll, we'll close if there's any questions uh, on site. So Worthy, great to hear from you now. Um, thank you so much for having me, Molly. It's been really wonderful to be here and hear all of these different perspectives and ideas about um, this issue. I, I just wanted to start off by saying that I really appreciated you starting off this conversation and framing it as like the reason why this is so important is because it's about fundamental rights. And I think in the United States, we've particularly been having a lot of conversations about how do you balance between preventing the harms of untruths online while protecting speech? And I think recognizing that by, I think, allowing this kind of harm to pro proliferate is, is uh, infringing on fundamental rights as well. Um, so I think that really resonated with me as I took a few notes uh, just as, as we were going along. Um, and so I think one thing I wanted to say is, I, again, with coming up with different regulatory and policy approaches to dealing with this issue. I know in the US, for example, we've been a bit slow in doing so. Um, and so in Saunders work, I think it was really interesting to think about um, what are other ways we can, you know, help people become better at identifying untruths online, um, as I think regulators and policymakers, I think, continue to think about how do we address this issue. Um, I think speaking, hearing from the fact checkers also is really um, was also really interesting and really brought me back to my time at Meta, where I had the opportunity to, um, from my perspective, look into some of the work that fact checkers and content moderators were doing to help prevent misinformation on harm. And I think some of the things you said really resonated with me, I think, in terms of how we allocate resources um, in a way that's not just purely focused on, like, English-speaking countries or, like, um, or like and totally forgetting to devote enough resources to um, other parts of the world that are similarly dealing with this um, this issue, particularly when you think about the fact that in some parts of the world, places like Facebook and other um, social media companies are really a big source for where people go to get their news online. Um, so I think it's really important for social media companies to really factor that in when they're thinking about how they allocate resources. I think that's definitely one of many places where um, social media companies could really improve. Um, I also think that, you know, as someone, although I'm in law school, I was an economics major before this, and I love data. And so I really do love to hear about the ways in which regulators, um, you know, multinational organizations are thinking about how data can be really leveraged and a really effective way to help tailor and target solutions to dealing with um, misinformation online. Um, and so I'm really excited to see that that work is ongoing now and really looking forward to seeing how that work develops and grows, um, you know, as time progresses. Thank you so much, Worthy. It's great to always have your insights, as always. Um, so, Hannah, I'm going to pass to you on site and see if there's any uh, questions in the room. I know we've hit time now. It's probably my my bad as a moderator, but there was just so much exciting stuff we didn't want to cut off. Uh, so, Hannah, I'm going to pass to you and see if there's uh, any questions in the room. So, as before, please raise your hand if you have a question. Yes, please. Uh, my question goes to uh, the fellow Ethiopian presenter. Uh, as users, for us to use from your thinking, first of all, we have to think about distance. Until today, I don't know that such fact checkers exist. So what do you do in order to increase 
your visibility. I mean, have you, for example, appeared on mainstream media or an, uh, all I'm saying is, how do you know your existence? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, fact-checking organizations, there are two local fact-checking organizations in Ethiopia, and there are two other uh, international fact-checking organizations working in Ethiopia. So, uh, the local fact-checking uh, organizations are called Ethiopia Check and Hack Check. Uh, so, I, you, I, I was working in Hack Check for the past two years, and we tried to reach as many people as possible on social media, also on mainstream media. Uh, for example, we started a television show, a weekly television show on artist TV that covers uh, the most uh, important issues in the week and uh, the most fact-checked issues in the week so, so that we can create awareness for the public and we can reach uh, more people on the mainstream media. So there are efforts uh, to reach the public and more people, but as I said, there is shortage and gap in resource, so uh, it's really uh, hard to manage everything with a, a numbered people. I mean, there are only four people in that organization working on the fact-checking, the publishing, the social media monitoring, and also the hosting the show and everything. So uh, the lack of shortage is what's keeping us from reaching uh, other people as well. So. Yeah, there is efforts. Thank you, and we have a next question. Thank you, my, my name is Grace Kimaru, and my question goes to Julia. Uh, she mentioned of um, the society coming in, in fighting the um, online and truths. And so my question is, uh, the society in fighting the um, online truths. What really should the society do in fighting the online untruths? Thank you. That is the major existential question. I'm, I mean, I think as tried as it is, and it's been said many times, I think we all have responsibility to maintain the integrity of discourse, the civility of discourse, the relative truth of, of discourse. Um, so, um, you know, there will always be people, um, you know, who will um, spread mal malicious um, disinformation. Um, there may be people who unwittingly share misinformation um, f for, for, for lack of education. But I think um, as we see it, we need to call it out. And I think if there are more people who are serving as virtual moderators across society and are demanding integrity and demanding truth, that is the role that society needs to play. And uh, I think we need to decide, um, you know, what it, what it is we're using the internet and these technologies for. Is it to bolster society, to supplement the good and to harness the benefits um, whilst min minimizing the risks? I think most people could agree with that. Thank you very much. And we are now five minutes past uh, the end time so i will thank again all the speakers and all uh, participants that came here for all the questions and your participation and uh, thank you and have a good rest of the day thank you Thank you to all the speakers very, very much. You contributed to making the, the session a, a great success. And uh, I'll be in touch. And I wish you a great rest of the day, evening, morning, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you, Bali. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.